companies. And we're seeing a lot of that today, too. So it's the windstorms, the epic, biblical, historic floods that are happening repeatedly, the uh, storms that are so big in uh, hurricanes, basically, land hurricanes that have such a wide diameter. Uh, we've never seen them so wide, so great in diameter before. We should know this because we've got to get prepared. But the basic, I think what we need to do, and I think you know too, that what we have to emphasize is, folks, just start saving. Don't throw away your plastic bottles. Rinse them out real well with hot water. Fill them up with tap water and store them in your basement. Get shelving that you can make like pieces of plywood. You can put pieces of plywood in between each layer of bottles so that you don't need these big expensive shelves, which actually waste a lot of height space because you're not going to make, you're going to, you can have a lot of empty space in between, uh, you know, the second shelf and the third shelf. So I just take basically uh, that masonite or particle wood, which is rather thin, eighth inch, and uh, I use that to separate layers of bottles. Of course, you want to take all the bottles that are pretty much the same height, put them all together in one layer, and then maybe I make one stack about uh, maybe 20 inches by 24, 20 by 24, and that'll be one stack of bottles, and then I put some masonite or particle board or even plywood in between each layer so I can get about four or five layers of bottles. Right. I have to choose, again, the ones that are very very often, though, you get bottles that are not exactly the same height, a little bit different. So what I do is I take a piece of cardboard, which is somewhat compressible, and some of that cushiony uh, foam um, packing material. It's like sheets. It comes in sheets. It's about an eighth inch or more in, yeah. uh, in thickness. And I put that in with a layer, sandwich that in with a layer of cardboard so that any different, any disparity in the heights of some of the bottles will be compensated for by the cushioning effect of that separating uh, cardboard sandwich with that spongy packing material, that spongy sheets of packing material. So anyway, it's a little bit time consuming, but yeah. my ba my ba basement is getting such that even though I have many, many, many bottles of water, I've got more empty bottles now than full bottles, and it's getting out of control. I've got to do something about it. I got to make it. I know I can't do it all in one day. So I'm going to have to make it a, a ritual to fill up, say, five bottles a day, rinse out, fill up, get all the bottles of the same height, put them together, and fill them up, Make it, keep on making layers, you know, because I got still got a lot of space between. I get, you know, a height that I can use up sure. before the bottle, the weight of the bottles gets too hot, heavy, you know, and starts to jeopardize the stability of the bottom layer, you know what I mean? Yeah. Too many layers there because you don't know if, if it's going to withstand all that weight. But I still got a lot to go. Anyway, that sounds mundane, sounds trivial, but it's the most important thing because when we lose power, which we're going to lose, and it's going to be for a long time. I'm not making this up. This comes from none other than the White House. You can look up the White House. I just posted it. My friend sent it to me. Uh, and actually, an executive order or some kind of what's his name, uh, Ed Koppel, who used to be a uh, ABC TV evening new, evening reporter. Mm -hmm. Koppel, remember him? The entire book. And now, Dr. Michio Kaku, a physicist at State University, I think New York, or City University in New York, also is warning about it. So many people are warning about these power outages, failures, long term. The reason they would be long term is because the solar emissions that I was just talking about are what is causing, I believe, long term chronic solar blasting. Um, is causing is hitting the Earth's magnetic field. And you had asked me a question which I didn't really address yet. You said, "Has it got anything to do with our magnetic field?" And well, the sun, sun, solar. Electrified particles, protons and electrons, that are being blasted out in all directions, striking some of which strike Earth's magnetic field. Well, that those moving electrons, as I mentioned before, they themselves, those streams of electrons coming from the sun and streams of protons, 
actually create each stream creates a little old magnetic field encircling it concentrically like sort of like a spring if you were to take an arrow here's another analogy put an arrow through a, a coil spring a garage door spring and that arrow would represent the travel straight line travel of the protons which are positive electrically charged particles or also the, would rep, that arrow re, would represent the straight line travel of the electrons which are negative electric particles mm -hmm. well both kinds of particles create magnetic fields which are sort of analogous in shape anyway to uh, the coiled garage door spring so you've got all these magnetic fields that are impacting trillions of them you know in, in a big solar wave of particles called the solar wind and blasting the earth's magnetic field creating magnetic electromagnetic streams like coils that i just described which impact earth's magnetic field and now you have what i consider what i liken to electromagnetic jousting where you see two people uh, fighting with swords or with these long jousting poles and knights on in armor jousting one another well you have the jousting of magnetic fields between the sun's solar blasting of magnetic fields and the earth's magnetic field and this impacts the earth's magnetic field it feeds back that energy from the sun electromagnetic energy from the sun feeds back electromagnetically right from the earth's outer core like the skin of an apple in through along the skin right into the top of the apple the dimple at the top of the apple but that goes into the center core like as you if you liken the earth to an apple so that electromagnetic energy travels thousands of miles from the earth's magnetic field space right into the center of earth where where in is located our earth's solid metal inner core and that's what i believe has been shifting laterally shifting earth's solid metal inner core off of its center point and causing eventually causing the jet stream to ripple like a roller coaster in the ancients let's go by past reports the ancient um survivors of the last incursion of planet x into our solar system with which occurred around uh, 36 and a half centuries ago and we can prove it uh, i'll try to make it quick because uh, i don't want to get too far off off of one point i want to prove to you that it occurred 36 and a half centuries ago uh, our geologists studying the great uh, santorini explosion which had a volcanic explosive index vei greater than the uh, according to their studies of past geological events greater than we've ever experienced in modern days the greater the great volcanic explosion of the santorini volcano in the aegean sea on the island of thera it's well known it destroyed the minoan cities a highly civilized minoan civilization uh, well that volcanic explosion they can date it back by counting tree rings tree rings are very one are a great way to very with high resolution determine a date in ancient history because each year as you know the tree grows one the trees will grow one layer of skin mm -hmm. and then each year that skin piles up and builds up so that if you were to cut the tree you would be able to count the layers until the age of the tree we all know that so I guess the trees they're looking at were petrified trees where they were able to do carbon dating and with carbon dating you could determine the date of something that's petrified so uh, when you would put that together with the carbon dating put together with the with the ring, counting of the rings the scientists have been able to actually determine when the great volcanic explosion of the Santorini volcano volcano occurred it caused tree rings to become narrowed because obviously when a volcano explodes and when many volcanoes explode around the world they kick up all this dead black ash that blocks out the sunlight so now the vegetation becomes starved and that's why you see narrow tree rings which they can count almost to the year plus or minus 10 years count to, to be somewhere around as I recall 1630 BC 1640 somewhere around there I don't even remember the exact year but you can look it up on Wikipedia 
that's another good thing about you know me putting out all this information. People might say, well, we're, I don't. He sounds like convincing, but I don't know. He's just saying a lot of words. <laughs> Now's your opportunity, folks. You can prove it all. Grab a pen and paper now. I forgot to tell you from the beginning of this show. Start writing down keywords that I mentioned: Santorini, S A N T O R I N I, volcano, and B C. Write down the term B C, and then you'll get reports as to when they they believe that it exploded, just by counting tree rings. They counted the tree rings in in the British Isles, and in Canada, and they found it all to be the same. Going, that's great. Uh, narrowing of tree rings occurred around third sixteen. 50 approximately plus or minus 10 years BC. So, uh, geez, now that was like 36 and a half centuries ago, and we've all been told that Planet X comes in every 36 and a half centuries because it is on a cometary orbit. Comets are like a pendulum, a cosmic pendulum that swings back and forth. Now we all know that a pendulum on a grandfather's clock is very precisely periodic. Regularly, uniformly, periodic. It, you can count the number. Of, you can measure the number of seconds or fractions of a second that a grandfather's clock pendulum swings. Well, similarly, we have cosmic pendulum, which are comets. Comets come into the sun, and what is the force that's pulling them in? It's the sun. The sun pulls them in. They come in, and they some of them crash into the sun and, and cease to exist. Others, like Halley's comet, we know come in at amazingly regular intervals of, I think it's like something like every 75 years Halley's comet comes in. So imagine a bigger comet, what they call long period comets, taking not 75 years to come in, but 36 and a half centuries to come in and out. But it's regular. It's predictable. It's chronologically predictable. Uh, so now we have. 30, we're saying 36 and a half centuries. Well, how can we prove what we've been told that this planet X comes in every 36 and a half centuries? We know for sure that the geologists or the ancient uh, the ecologists who study ancient ecology have proven that the tree rings were narrowed roughly 36 and a half centuries ago, around 1650 BC, which coincides with the great exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, which is historically recorded. In the book of Exodus of the Bible, okay, mm -hmm. but we still don't know if it's every 36 and a half centuries, unless we can go back another 36 and a half centuries before 1650 BC and prove it that it's periodically regular, uniform. Well, let's go back from count back, do some arithmetic, and go back from 1650 BC when the great Exodus of The, uh, of the Israelites occurred from Egypt where God created all these natural disasters due to comets coming into our solar system. God created all this to liberate the Israelites from Egypt. 36 and a half centuries before 1650 B.C. takes you, 36 and a half centuries before 1650 B.C. takes you to around 5300 BC. I didn't do the arithmetic now because I had done it before and I already remembered. 5300 BC was the previous incursion, the second past incursion of planet X into our solar system. Now, if that's true, we should see geological disasters occurring around 5300 BC. And sure enough, there are two famous geologists, Pittman, and people should be writing this down, checking it out because. The only way you're going to really believe it is when you look it up yourself and, and do, wow, I've done the research myself. I've taken, I can take this to the bank. I know it's happening. Therefore, I know I must get prepared. Whereas if you just hear me say it and you don't check it out yourself, you're not going to believe it and you're not going to get prepared. So you write down Pittman and Ryan, P -I, I think it's P-I-T-M-A-N-N -N and Ryan, R-Y-A-N. Just look up those two names and... Um, They're just right in the term BC, and you'll get some of their reports that they had done research on the Black the Black Sea. Oh, this Black Sea had actually overflowed, and when it was like sort of on a plateau, I believe, as I recall, and it overflowed into the Straits of Bosporus. In the I'm just going by memory, so I may have some 
you know, the variations in my recollection that are not accurate. But I'm pretty sure they overflowed into the Straits of Bosphorus or into the Mediterranean somehow. And they've shown from studying silt deposits in the Black Sea that that overflow, that great flooding overflow of the Black Sea occurred around 5300 B.C. So now we have two points, two index points to show us, yeah, look, we can measure between... 1650 B.C., the last the disasters of the tree rings narrowing, the explosion of the, vol- of the great Santorini volcano and many, many other volcanoes on Earth, 1650 B.C., use that as one index point, and then another index point would be 5300 B.C. So there you go. This is 36 and a half centuries ago. Between, I mean, between disastrous events, 36 and a half centuries. But let's try to go back one more just to be to seal our evidence okay. that the uh, indeed that the period the time between each great earth disaster is about 36 and a half centuries we need to know this because if it's true then the next disaster earth disaster is about to occur sometime soon in our you know in a foreseeable future okay let's go back another let's count back 36 and a half centuries back before 5300 B.C., which was the great flood of Noah's day, 5300 B.C. Let's count back 36 and a half centuries before that, and you wind up around 9000 B.C. Now, many people, it's so far back that many people are confused or mistaken about dating the sinking, the great sinking of Atlantis. But some of your best archaeologists are saying they believe it occurred around 9000 B.C., And if that's true, and I believe it is, 9000 B.C. was when the great sinking of Atlantis occurred. That was a tremendous Earth disaster. The greatest disaster is going to be loss of power for months and years, probably years, because these million-dollar transformers that can only come from China, and how are you going to get them from China if China has power outages and there's no shipping because there's no power at the ports? And there's no transportation on the highways because all the power is out. So those million-dollar transformers that are needed to replace the ones that are blown and sizzled by the solar blasting that's about to occur, which our government tells us is going to occur, those transformers will never get here. So we'll have, like, you might as well say, the remainder of our lifetime, we'll have to live without power. You know, it's going to be disastrous starvation. Nobody knows how to grow food. But so you got to store food, store as many, as much canned food, dry grains and stuff that's, you know, you know, I don't have to tell you all about yeah. the high protein grain that they kept the Incas uh, alive on. Well, uh, it's going to be disastrous. Well, first thing we've got to do is store enough food to keep us alive for a while until we get the hang of growing our own food, well, which means we've got to start storing seeds. And, uh, you know, you can get a lot of nutrition out of uh out of the stuff that you grow indoors, like, for example, you can get enough to keep you alive almost if you sprout inside using jars in your house. So, And this way, when you're, you've got the protection of your house to keep your food st- sheltered, whereas if you have a garden outside, your neighbors, starving neighbors, are going to become uh, marauders. They're st- they and their families are starving. So you can't grow anything outdoors when there's a... When there's a Society is in chaos, in starvation mode. Uh, But, I mean, this is bad news, but it's also good news. If you can store enough food and keep yourself uh, undercover long enough, I hate to even say this, but in a couple weeks, everybody else who threatens you, they'll be dead. So you won't have any threats around you. Yeah, and that is definitely one of the bittersweet things that we will have to deal with. You know, it's it's always a bummer to know that people will die and people will suffer. However, for those of us who are prepared, we know that there's a certain window that we have to be really worried in. And then after that, most of the people will be... Um, folks who were prepared or folks who have made it to that point and who are now able to take care of themselves. So um, what about uh, brown dwarfs and the fact that uh, they spew a lot of helium? 
could that be something that would uh, really have an impact on our planet at, if, if planet Nibiru or if um, the system, uh, the Nibiru system, is led by a brown dwarf through our section of the galaxy? Could the helium or maybe even the iron rust that it's putting off have a massive effect on our planet? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it does spew out helium. Like, for example, Jupiter our largest planet in our solar system is similar in nature to to a brown dwarf to it's similar in nature to planet x in in so far as it is a gas giant and it's almost large enough to actually create nuclear fusion as our sun does uh now is it, there's methane i don't know what the gases are it's maybe methane i i haven't really studied it too well I don't know anything about helium. No, wait a minute. Maybe you're right. You're right. When you have nuclear fusion, you have helium produced. Right, because the sun actually produces helium in nuclear fusion. It fuses hydrogen, which is has a nucleus of one, a nucleus of hydrogen. It's very small, the smallest of all the elements, I believe. It has only one, uh, one proton in its nucleus whereas most of the other atoms have more than one proton in a nuclei, which defines their character. Uh, oxygen, for example, has 16 protons in its comprising its nucleus, which makes that's the characteristic of oxygen. That's just an example. Hydrogen has only one proton. So what happens with hydrogen is when you have nuclear fusion, two hydrogen atoms are actually crunched together, and you wind up with not H1 hydrogen, but H2, that's two, the number two represents the number of, of protons in the nucleus, and you wind up with the, the distinct element of, of uh, helium. Does have helium in the nuclear fusion? I don't know how much is spewed out. I can tell you with our sun. Our sun is another good example, a good way of describing the chemical characteristics of, of a brown dwarf star because our sun is a star. It's just bigger than a brown dwarf star. So, but our sun blows out high, uh, electrons and protons again, which are heli. Uh, pro I'm sorry, protons which are hydrogen nuclei minus their single valence electron. So it blows out hydrogen and electrons, but hydrogen protons, I should say, and electrons. But I don't know anything about the sun blowing out helium. Yeah, and that was just something that I had uh, come across and read um, while I was reading about the fact that they had found helium-3 on the moon, and obviously helium-3 is a rare element, but um, they say that one ton of helium-3 could actually power the United States with clean energy for a year. So 2,000 pounds of this helium-3, if they could bring it back from the moon, uh, which has an abundance of helium-3 up there. We don't have a whole lot on planet Earth. It's very, very hard to extract any here, but there's an abundance on the moon. So if they could bring that back, 2,000 pounds of it, it's enough to power the United States for a whole year. So obviously that is uh, something that we would want to look into uh, if we can, if it's feasible as a source of renewable energy. But then I read about um, the helium being put off uh, by brown dwarfs and you know was wondering if that could be a huge issue if it passed close by putting off all that iron oxide dust and the the, the levels of helium that we would be putting off that helium gets into our atmosphere and obviously it's a greenhouse gas so it could cause havoc within the atmosphere and but you know that point's neither here nor there, I guess. I mean, this brown dwarf star is like a vacuum cleaner or a magnet in space. As it travels through space, junk litter, deep space, I mean, far beyond our solar system, comes in from millions, millions, billions of miles away, and it drags and gravitationally attracts all kinds of objects. It attracts small planets. It attracts comets. It attracts uh, asteroids. It attracts even iron oxide dust that's particles of all sizes so when it comes in it looks like a hazy green a hazy red object and someone has actually taken somehow uh, smuggled 
pictures, films of it, at least a film clip of this Planet X, which we believe came from the South Pole Telescope. It's a quasi-secret uh, telescopic location of, of infrared telescopic site that our government has secretly erected in the South Pole, the harshest environment you can imagine. Why would they do that? In, in putting up a telescope in the harshest environment on Earth in the South Pole, because that's where Planet X was coming in below the, the Earth's ecliptic, between the solar system's ecliptic plane, which is that imaginary disk in space. I, can, I visualize it as like a glass disk on which all the planets revolve around the sun. And uh, they, someone captured these films and put them on the Internet in, under the name Nibiru Shock 2012. And they were taken down really quickly. And I just hope that that person who may have worked at that uh, Pole, uh, South Pole Telescope is still alive. But uh, the bottom, basically what I was saying was that, that the pictures show, and I have them on my website too, is a hazy red glow around this object. It looks almost like a, like a flame of a candle. If you were to run with a candle in your outstretched arm, the flame would sort of be pulled back, stretched backwards. And that's what this object looks like with a stretched backwards tail. Where can we find these pictures of what you're talking about? The Light of Day Radio Show dot com. When you go there, you'll see a big Planet X logo at the top of the page. Click on that logo. You have to wait a second for it, a few seconds for it to load because there's a trend, tremendous number of my audio interviews in my Planet X audio dramas, very interesting, exciting musical dramas that I put up about Planet X. So it's loaded with lots of data, and it takes a little while to load. But when you click on that, that Planet X logo at the top of the page of the Light of Day Radio Show dot com, it'll take you to my Planet X page. And then you'll see at the very top is a clip of that Nibiru Shock 2012 release, which was suppressed. Okay, and with that, we're going to take a quick bio break. And that will wrap up Section 2, of, or Part 2, of this interview. Be sure and stick around. Parts 3 and 4 will be coming out soon, well, hopefully this evening. And um, I hope you're enjoying this uh, lecture series. And for now, that's about all. We're going to wrap it up, and we will talk to you soon. <laughs>